When I saw you standing, standing in the garden, in the garden, wet with rain. You wipe the teardrops from your eyes in sorrow. Yeah, we watch the petals fall down to the ground. Uh, hello and welcome to the first of a uh, new series called Candid Conversations from the channel Word According to Orp. Um, and the, the basic idea here is just for one or two or, well, for two or three people, maybe to have a candid conversation about things that matter and things that we don't often talk about that really do need to be shared and discussed. Today is a sad day here in our household. I'm sitting here with my wife, Orla, and um, we, uh, was it two days ago now? It seems to me like weeks or months. We had the passing of a beloved family member and you know we're just plunged into the deep pool of grief devastation sadness and a, a sense of you know loss tremendous sense of loss and being lost so we're just going to discuss the situation and uh, remember charlie and uh, hopefully it might help anybody out there who was in this position or is in this position or maybe help them if they ever get into this position to know that you know grief and this kind of suffering is a uh, it's a natural part of life just as death is and we need to go through it we we can't be you know trying to push it away and pretend it's not happening and have it pushed down into the cellar for it to keep popping back up later or for it to mingle with other unresolved issues. That's what I'm talking about. Getting things like this resolved and it doesn't happen in one sitting and it may take days, it may take weeks, it may take months. It all depends on the individual. Grief is a tricky thing, but it's a natural thing and it's not something that somebody needs to be telling us to get over and to move on. Grief will take its time and we need to sit with it and share it and uh, hopefully have encouragement and support from other people. Um, so hopefully this podcast might be of some use and help to any listeners out there. So I'm going to introduce my beautiful wife, Orla, and um, if you might want to say hi to the audience, Orla. Hi. Hello. So Orla's um, still really, I mean, I'm, we're, we're both feeling it. I'm just been lucky to be able to switch off now and again. And at this moment, I've been able to disconnect from what really is some overwhelming grief. In fact, I had never imagined that I could have felt this much grief for a death of a family member, even if that was a, a little furry ball of love named Charlie, who was our cat. Uh, well, he wasn't really our cat. <laughs> we were his slaves, but slaves in a good way. He came and he adopted us and in fact, you know, that might be a good place to start, Orla. Why, you've got some really good memories of when we first encountered him. And maybe you just tell the quick story of how we did that and how he came to slowly adopt us. Well, it was the first day I went out to do the garden and I saw this little head pop out of a hedge with a black and white face with a little moustache. And, uh, I thought so I... J j just for clarification, when you say the first day you went out to do the garden, so we had just moved in here about six years ago, six years, six and, and as years I recall, ago. the back garden was so overgrown, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. So you were out there for the first time, starting to clear away the brush and everything. Yeah. And you saw his little face. So I knew he kept watching me. I, I tried to get him to come over, but he was very shy. He seemed to be timid. So I continued what I was doing, and I could see him sort of sneaking around after me, studying me. And I kept trying to get him to come over, and he wouldn't. And and every now, every time I'd go near the garden, he'd come out, he'd appear out of nowhere and he'd study me again. And very slowly he decided one day to come over and let me sort of look at him closer or maybe he wanted to look at me closer. I'm not sure, a bit of both. <laughs> then he let me touch him. Yeah. And then he... And what, what was that, like 
petting him on the head? Or? Yeah. Well, I have to say, the first time his little head popped out, I think it was, for me, instant love. It was like, he was so beautiful. He was so cute. He was so different. And he had his funny little mustache. Yeah. Beautiful green eyes. And uh, bit by bit, very slowly, he kind of let me know, okay, we can be friends. You, you, you know, I'll be, I'm very cautious, but you have to work for it. And I was more than willing to do the work. And this is over like months, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Really yeah. slow. Like I bring home shoe boxes and put them out the back and see would he like the shoe box? And then he'd get in the shoe box. But then it was like, no, I don't like it. Just go. And, but when I'd go away, he'd get in the shoe box. Yeah. It was very funny. Um, but it took him a long time. It took him a long time to, to kind of come around. But he did. He kind of let us become friends. And it was lovely. Couldn't ask for anything nicer. So then the next big step in the evolution was um, we had just moved in and we had our bed downstairs uh, at the back part of the living room. And there's a door facing the bed and then that's the kitchen. And right to the left is the back door. Yeah. And as I remember, the back door was open. Yeah. It was a beautiful day. Beautiful day. Yeah. And although we had had these momentary meetings with him and even starting to get to pet him. Yeah. He was quite, um, as I remember, he was quite cautious and a bit uh, on edge. He, if you made a loud bang out of nowhere, oh, yeah. he'd jump and he'd run away. Uh, yeah. So what happened that day? Well, I was in here and I had music on, nice music playing. And um, out of nowhere, he just, next thing, I was cleaning the room. And next thing out of nowhere, he just jumped on the bed, lay on the bed. And looked at me as much as say, hello, I'm here now. I've decided now we're definitely going to be friends. And I played the music again. I thought maybe it was a song. Ooh, I don't know. Well, it could have been because he did like that from then on, didn't he? That yeah. was Hollis scene by Bonnie Bear. Yes. And that was it. That was the moment. That was it. So we just made that connection then where he, he kind of opened up, threw off his, uh, his armor. His barrier. He'd studied us long enough. <laughs> yeah, he, he came to trust us. Yep. And um, so where did he come from? Well, we, we weren't aware until the neighbor told me that he was from three gardens behind us, sort of down the road from us. We didn't know that. And that sometimes he wandered into her house. Her husband woke up one morning and he was in bed with him. <laughs> <laughs> but he seemed to know people in the neighborhood. He seemed to call around to everybody. Yeah. But... He was always known as a quiet gentleman cat. That's yeah. kind of what he was. Well, he was in his uh, tuxedo. Yes. And his bright white shirt. He was always dressed. <laughs> and his uh, white gloves. Um, now, as far as we could piece together over time, we have houses, backyards coming onto our backyard. And so the house that's right behind us, about two to three houses down, he lived with them. And uh, we did meet her because, well, we'll come to that. Uh, she told us that um, he had been abandoned by his mother. No, and his mother had died and she, he'd been killed by a car. His mother was killed by a car. And then the kittens, two kittens were found in a hedge. Okay. And they were little kittens, him and his brother. And she took Charlie and the brother went somewhere else. No, so they... she took both kittens. Oh, okay. So what happened to the other kitten? They ran away. Well, that could be some kind of insight too, because... Well, as far as we can tell, um, they may have just used him as an outdoor cat for chasing mice away and stuff. Because he did seem to be looking for a home. Well, we know cats are the way cats are. They yeah. choose you. Yeah, um, you can't really own a cat. It's nothing to do with whether you're good to them or not good to them or whether you're wonderful to yeah. them. They just choose who they choose. Yeah. No, we're not saying anything about whether she's was good to him. But he seemed to want something different. And um, so anyway, over time, it was like he'd spend 5% of his time here. And we assume the rest wandering around the neighborhood and with her. And we were both feeding the cat. And um, that kept increasing. 10% of the time here, 20% of the time here. And then he got sick. He had a big lump down the stomach and we called her right mm -hmm. and she came around and she took him to the vet he didn't seem too happy to 
get in that cat box and go. Mm. But as far as I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, he had some kind of abscess. He'd had a fight with a fox. So and he had a scratch it. on him with some infection. Right. And that was like this hardened piece of... He took antibiotics for five days and he was fine. Yeah. So he got fine and uh, and it just continued until finally um, he was here all the time. Well, after the whole vet visit thing, he just seemed to move in then. That was it. He yeah. was like, I'm, I've packed up my non-bags and I'm living here now. Yeah. And, and then we... We had a visit from the daughter and she basically asked us if we would stop feeding him and not let him in. And we couldn't do that because um, he was, he'd scratch at the back door and, and meow. And um, we loved him at that point and we just thought, that's his decision. Yeah, well, you know, it was, he could do what he wanted, go where he wanted, yeah. the total freedom. Um, the fact I'm always in the garden meant that the back door was usually open yeah. anyhow. And then, yeah, he started to become your gardening pal. Yeah. And he loved the garden and he loved watching you um, plant and dig and water. And he'd be beside you. Yeah, and, uh, kind of running the show. Yeah, yeah. And then for some reason, he'd, whenever he did the front garden and the door was open and uh, he'd sit in the doorway right where you'd have to step yes. over him. Yes, that was part of the game. Yeah. And then he'd get into the middle of the front garden and just kind of sit there and watch people go by and walk in their dogs. And he was, he looked like he was real proud. Look at me in my garden. Yeah. So we thought of it as his garden and Orla kept it up beautifully. And um, so then that was that. He was here all the time. He just decided this was his home. And then the second phase came, he started to, now I just, just so you understand, I grew up, we never had a dog growing up. We did have a couple of cats and um, I like cats. Uh, I, I also had a, uh, what's the word, an allergy. To their fur. To their fur. And I did have an allergy to Charlie in the beginning, but I usually, um, if, if, if the animal is around me long enough, I build up a resistance and then I don't have it. And in those days uh, as a teenager growing up when we had cats, um, I never really bonded with any of them. I didn't dislike them. I petted them, but I didn't feel this strong bond or love. And so, like a lot of people, I, um, you know, I saw other people who were owners of pets, dogs, cats, bunny rabbits, snakes, anything you like. And the odd time you'd find out that the pet was sick or had died, and I'd see the devastation and grief that the owner was having. And I didn't quite understand it. I, I kind of thought it was a bit over the top or there was maybe something not right with that person. It's like, hey, come on, it's just a cat. You know, you got to move on. And, you know, I was that kind of person who would think like that. I don't think I ever said that to anybody, but uh, I didn't quite get it. It was uh, something I could see and, and experience that people did this, but I didn't quite get it. So it was to my absolute shock to find out how devastated I was uh, two days ago. Well, let, let's talk about that. So Charlie got sick again, maybe five weeks ago. Five <laughs> weeks ago. Well, you were quite in the midst of that. So tell us what happened there. Well, he was, as usual, gentleman cat self. And then um, all of a sudden he seemed to collapse on the floor and he was crying in pain and we rang a friend and we rushed him to a vet and we had him checked and she said everything about him seems okay and the only thing that could possibly be like that she hadn't been able to check for would be something maybe with his head or his heart and anyhow he we got home we had five weeks of he was great just perfect to be to begin with he was very discombobulated yeah. And he would go into different closets and different bedrooms. But he and, was healing. That's what yeah. I felt. He was healing, which he did. He was healing slowly but surely. And um, that this thing that he had been doing where he'd sit looking confused and lost and he'd turn his head to the left and then slowly to the right and back and forth, that stopped. 
he, he kept eating and we kept loving him and, and um, grooming him. And he did a lot of grooming, but he seemed to want to spend a lot of time on his own in the closet. And we left him to it. We go and check on him from time to well, time. I brought his food up on a tray. Yeah. <laughs> and in each closet, he had his own blankets on, on the ground and he was very cozy. And then he really perked up and he came out. He was great. And he was really loving the sunshine and uh, the garden. Playing and doing all sorts of Yeah, in fact, didn't he even become more affectionate? Yeah, it was like, it was almost, it was almost like we'd taken another step with him where he was going, you know, I'm really loved. Yeah. Um, they really just love me. Um, and all he had to do was <laughs> just one look and it was like, come on, you have to come out to the garden with me. You have to, I'll bring you on a garden tour, as, yeah, as we used speaking. to call it, where, you know, I'll bring you over here to look at my chair and look at this plant and here's my other plant and I'm going to eat some grass. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he'd bring you out and he'd make you follow him around and he'd do his little stops at different yeah. things as if he was saying, it's a tourist oh, attraction. I like this, look at my chair, look at this plant, he'd eat a bit of grass. We give him, but he had his own catnip plant, and we'd tear a few leaves off, and he'd eat them, and then he'd uh, just flop himself down on the ground for petting and loving, and and he'd be playful, and he'd you know paw you. And, he was in great form. Yeah, and and he became more vocal. Yes. Not in a in a screechy way. He just he'd walk in and he'd go, yeah, well, well, I'm here. Well, every time you left the house, he would sing the song of his people, which basically in cat terms, it was like he was singing Pavarotti at the side of the house with the echo, as though like he'd been abandoned forever. And I'd end up running out to him going, I'm here. And it's like, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm calling for Owen. I know he's only gone down the road for five minutes, but I will sing the song of my people to make him come back. Yeah, there's a, every day I either go down to, a, there's just five minutes down the road to a shop and come back. Or up the road to a supermarket, it takes me maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And he'd wait for you. And he would wait. And um, this is going to be one of the hardest things. It's already started when I go down to the shops and I come back. And and I'm so programmed now, I just expect to see the door open, the really? front door, and him sitting there waiting for me. And as soon as he sees me, he jumps up and he runs out and I meet him on the driveway. And he throws himself down for me to pet him and love him. And one of the things uh, I'm sure cat lovers and owners know is um, as far as uh, experts think that the way a cat sh uh, gives you hugs in cat language is they lick you. And that increased massively uh, towards the end. I mean, literally, I'd be petting him and he'd turn his head and he'd start licking my hand over and over for... I mean, he'd keep going until I actually take my hand off and start petting him. So we don't know. I mean, how do you know the mind of a cat? But it seemed that he certainly had gone to this new level of loving us and showing it and being happy and enjoying life, like, like really in the moment. And when I was with him, I'd be really in the moment. And so we got to... The day before, I was talking on the phone to my mother, and I, she said, how's the cat? And I said, oh, it's great news. He's like 99% better. The only thing left is his breathing is a bit rapid and shallow. I mean, we can see it, his stomach. And bar that, man, he's better than ever, right? He was yeah. just better than ever. And we were so happy, and everything was great, and the sun was shining. The garden was bursting in, in, in bloom and color. And then it was, well, it was Tuesday morning at about two-ish when it started. You were... I couldn't sleep, so I got up I, I got up at two. And usually at this point, he would have come in for a snack because in the summer, he likes to be outside on his chair. And I look out and I see him on his chair. And when I looked out, he wasn't on the chair. And I was thinking, where is he? That's strange. And so I kept... I went, looked out the window, I looked out the back door, and then um, I still couldn't sleep. And then at three, um, he came in and he asked for food. It's, and he had some food and he had a few snacks. And I was downstairs because it was so warm, I was sleeping downstairs. So he, he came in the room and normally he'd go straight upstairs to get in his box on the bed. But instead he stayed with me, which was strange but I thought well maybe it's because it is cooler down here and then he let out that terrible cry 
and I jumped up and I yelled him and I don't know if he could hear me and for some reason I started blowing on him gently and he looked at me and he let out another cry and then he was on the floor, he fell on the floor and then I got to call you oh, by the time we two of us ran back into the room he was gone yeah um it was very fast that's the one thing i'll say I, i'm so happy and thankful he came in to us and i'm so happy he didn't go off on his own because cats are really notorious for going on their own i'm so glad he gave us that last moment to hold him but i just so i was uh fast asleep upstairs in bed and i i heard that cry that first cry and it just sort of went into my dream and it was absorbed in. And I, I guess for a moment I was awake and then I went back to sleep and then I heard it again. Then I heard Orla calling me and I knew it was not good. Uh, we, part of us, I think, in the back of our minds had been waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, he, that last, very last day, he was great. I, I was saying to your mom on the phone, it was... Your mum has a phrase that she got from her grandson um, when it was his last day in Ireland with his grandmother before they moved to America. When he was what, about? Six. Six-ish, yeah. And it had been a beautiful sunny day and they'd spent the day together and she'd had a wonderful day with him and he, in the garden and he was playing before they flew to the he, States. He was trying to catch bees. Yes. So when she was giving him his bath and getting him ready into his pyjamas and he said, Nana, that was a great bee catching day and I always thought that was such a beautiful phrase and Charlie had a great bee catching day on Monday it was so beautiful it was just perfect he was playful it was a hot day so I'd given him his usual outdoor kind of gentle bath to cool him down he walked around with his tea towel on which was one of his favorite <laughs> things <laughs> he likes sashaying around in different outfits <laughs> tea towels <laughs> sometimes plastic bags <laughs> Uh, the, those, that plastic that has bubbles in it, he yes, liked he that. Liked, like that. Um, but he, he just he helped me with the garden as usual, watering all the plants. He talked to the neighbor. Well, he didn't talk to the neighbor. He ignored the neighbor. But anyway, he he, uh, he was great. So so when I heard you calling out, I ran downstairs and um, there he was. Warlow was beside him, and he was. He was gone. Well. He was lying there, very, very still, and the worst part was, his eyes were open. Yeah. So I put my hand in front of his um, nose, and I felt nothing, and I looked closely, and I saw no breathing. So I, I did the only thing I could think to do, and I started massaging his chest, you know, trying to do CPR to some degree. And... Um, you know, I did it as long and as hard as I could and try to shock him. And it just became very apparent that this is it. He's gone. And it was devastating. It was... So we sat there Gross. from three to maybe seven or eight, just being with him and talking and crying and disbelieving i mean they say grief goes through different stages and one of the first one is denial i think is the first one isn't it non-acceptance and it was just i mean orla kept saying why why and why couldn't he have spent more time and he'd just gotten better you know and so that was very 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 difficult and um so I tried to sleep because there was nothing we could do. And we knew what was coming next. Um, we live in Ireland. And fortunately, the law is if you've got your own property and if you've got a place that you can bury uh, a pet, um, if you're not going to be anywhere near water to contaminate it, and if you follow the basic uh, guidelines, which is at least two feet deep, and then use lime, underneath and above before you put the soil in and we knew this was facing us um and the guy who the friend who had very kindly jumped in his car and brought us to the vet with him we called him to see if he could pick up some lime and again very kindly he did he jumped in his car and he brought over some lime 
And here's the thing, you know, he's a 58 year old man. He's, um, you know, he looks like, a, you know, a strong, rugged man and he's a man's man. And when I was speaking to him on the phone, telling him, this is kind of what we're talking about. He had had a couple of pets. And certainly he mentioned his uh, sister's dog and his mother who had died a couple of years ago. And suddenly, boom, he was crying like a baby, just like me. The door had opened on the box he had buried his grief in, which I don't think is fully resolved. Uh, maybe never will be, and that's okay. And he just lost it and he couldn't take it, but he finally pulled it together and came out with the lime. He was trying to help us with the digging, but he shoved the, the spade down so hard he broke the handle. But fortunately, we were just about nearly there and we had to get down on our hands and knees and pull rocks out. And then came that really, just something you never want to face. And we knew what we had to do and he couldn't take it. And he just said, I can't be around for this. So he left us to it, which is probably the best thing. And so we knew that um, it's not good to wrap an animal in plastic because it's not biodegradable. And so it's said that you should get something that's kind of breathable, biodegradable, cotton, linen. So I was looking through my t-shirts and um, I found one. And I just thought, you know, Charlie did have a sense of humor, so he'd like this. On the, on the front of the t-shirt was a picture of a cat. And underneath it said, um, Schrodinger's cat, wanted, dead or alive. So we wrapped him in that. Now at this stage, rigor mortis had set very heavily in, and he was very stiff and very heavy. And I don't understand how that works, do you? This thing about dead weight. But, I mean, you could pick him up pretty easy. I mean, he was a big cat, and he did weigh something, but you could pick him up easy. But the two of us, trying to pick him up to put him onto the T-shirt, he just seemed to weigh a ton. And we put him in, and then we wrapped him in that, and then Orla had a nice white linen blouse that she didn't need anymore, and wrapped him in that. And then we had to lift him up and bring him out to where he now rests and we put him in well the lime is down we put him on top then we put the rest of the lime on top and then the really hard part was to oh, we put some flowers yeah he, he got his catnip right yeah, loads of and loads of nice flowers purple and different Hi. colors and uh so then the soil and stuff went over him and as some of you may have seen, you know, I took a picture of where he now rests. He had these little friends in his garden. He had a duck and he had a cat. These, these were ornaments. And he had a, a, a lamb. And so Orla planted a... What kind of flowers are those you put on top? It's a kind of a hydrangea, a blue hydrangea. Okay. So she put some blue hydrangea plant on top, which will now you know, grow out of the nutrients from Charlie. And we placed his best friends around him. And I feel it's very fitting. I mean, he so much loved his garden. If he could speak, he would have said, this is where I want to go. And he's there now. And it's hard to walk out there because, A, he was always somewhere. He had all these chairs. <laughs> and he <laughs> he'd play like musical chairs with himself. He, you'd look out at one point, he'd be in one chair, and you'd look away, and you'd look out again, he'd be in another chair. Well, you see the shady chair and the sunny yeah. chair, depending on his mood. Yeah, or under the chair. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he spent um, in the last probably two weeks, and about two weeks before it happened, he became fixated on, he had heard a mouse, and he spent most of his time out there still staring, waiting. And as you know, a cat, if he can catch the mouse or the bird or whatever, he'll often bring it to his slaves. <laughs> we say owners, but we're, you know, the, you know, if you're a cat lover, they're not, well, you're not their owner. And he, he brought a mouse into Orla one morning, about two weeks before it happened, before he passed. And, uh, there, you know, there, that's my gift to you. 
look, I'm doing my job. Because he knew his job was looking after the garden, keeping uh, intruders out. And um, that was his way of giving back something. It's like a gift. So he gave us that gift. Oh, one of the gifts that we used to give him every week. <laughs> he got a little taste for fillet steak. And every week Orla goes to visit her mother and there's a butcher's out there and she gets a piece of fillet steak for us. And the butcher always cuts off because he knows about Charlie and he goes, there's a piece for Charlie. And it, was a, it became a ritual. A lot of things became ritualized. He'd know when she was gone all day where she was. And as soon as she started, we expected her home. I'd say to him, Orla's coming home. She's going to have, well, we called it stack for some reason. <laughs> uh, she's going to have your stack. And I'd make that noise. And that was only for the, the steak. So he knew. And uh, when I felt it was about time, we'd go to the front door together. And I'd sit beside him. And we'd wait. And Orla would come around the corner. And... Uh, it was the whole routine. We'd he'd be all excited, and then he'd immediately jump on the the chair in the kitchen, the stool. And yeah, Owen would cook the steak in butter, <laughs> <laughs> uh, lightly sautéed, and then I'd work medium rare, run it under cold water to cool it down, and he'd sit waiting, all excited, up on the counter at this point. Little meowy sounds, yeah. and then um, sometimes he'd try and grab it before it was cooled, and then he'd get it. And run away with it. Yeah. So like we were going to take he it. Jump down off the counter with it in his mouth as yeah. though he had just like caught a caught mouse. It. Yeah. And he'd usually run out the back. And he'd look around and then he'd hunker down and eat it. And boy, would he just chomp down. On <laughs> then he'd come back in and we'd have a piece. We'd have it ripped up and we'd have a piece hanging over the edge of the counter. And he'd look up and he'd shove his paw up with his claws out and catch it in a claw, pull it down and run out again and do that. And then sometimes he'd leave pieces. So throughout the rest of the evening and night, he knew he could just jump up there and get it. Yeah. So he loved that. And that was a weekly thing. We did a lot of rituals at, at night. Often I'd be in bed first um, as I read or watch something on YouTube or make these, these uh, creations for word according to Orb. And um, I'd hear Orla, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And she'd have Charlie in her arms. And he knew what was happening. And he'd just... Go limp, he'd be kind of... He was, the like, way, he was like bag pose. Yeah, and the way he'd carry a baby. So his back is downwards and his face is upwards in, the, in her arms. And she'd come in and he knew and she'd bring him over to me. And he'd just flop his head down and I'd start kissing him on his head and his cheeks. And he, he liked it and he was so relaxed. He'd nearly slide out of your arms. <laughs> yeah. like, but when he had enough, yeah. that was it. He'd, he'd push me away. Yeah, stop with the, stop with the kiss. Um, Sometimes he scratched me, but it was never intended. And you could always tell he was sorry he did it, which reminds me of a quick story. In the early days when the bed, bed was still down here and he was still a bit jumpy and any big noise, sudden noise made him um, flee. So I'm sitting on the bed with him and he's quite comfortable sitting there in his meatloaf position. <laughs> and Orla had washed her hair and she'd come down and she sat on the floor and plugged in the hair dryer. And then switched on the hairdryer. And that sound, he was like a coiled spring. He sprang straight up into the air, right beside me. And then the next thing, his paws like pushed at me so he could spring off me. And then he was gone. Well, suddenly I'm like, oh God, what? I felt like I was having a heart attack. The pain in my left chest. <laughs> around my nipple was excruciating. <laughs> and I thought, what is going on? I pulled off my t-shirt and it was like a horror movie poster. <laughs> there was my nipple <laughs> surrounded by three long scratch marks, uh, blood pumping out of them. <laughs> and I just thought, Jesus, he could have sliced my nipple in half. <laughs> I was quite lucky. And I, I don't know what it is with their claws. They have something on them because the worst pain I ever had was in uh, Tampa, Florida, where I got sunburnt on the beach. And it was so bad that when I started taking a shower that night, it flared up. And it was like, the only thing I could describe it as was like red army ants. A whole bunch of them under my skin, on my back and shoulders, running around biting me. I couldn't scratch. I couldn't do anything. And it was agony for hours. And this was kind of like that. 
those three deep, deep claw scratches. Well, he felt very guilty and I forgave him, of course. And he hardly ever did anything like that again, but that wasn't his fault. He just got scared. So that's the story of Charlie. And, um, well, there's thousands of stories of Charlie. Well, yes, absolutely. And they're absolutely. all pretty much wonderful or funny. Yeah. And we could talk all day about Charlie. We could. And, um, maybe some more stories will come up. I wanted to ask you, I asked you the other day and I thought it was worth asking you again. You're very, very much in grief right now. And you had a dog once called Harvey Einstein Mensa. Now, <laughs> I don't know why it was called that. In fact, let me ask you, why is it called Harvey Einstein Mensa? Because he was a genius. Okay, well, well, what age did you get him at? He's a puppy. No, what age were you? Oh, gosh, I, in my 20s, I guess. Okay, so you thought he was a really smart basset hound puppy. He was the best. So you call him Harvey Einstein Mensa, well, and of course you just called him Harvey, yeah. uh, day by day. And... The Einstein Mensa was a joke. But... Yeah, okay. So we'll come back on him, but you lost him, and you had tremendous grief and heartbreak. And I think I was trying to comfort you the other day, and I said, you know, as bad as this seems right now, you know that you'll eventually get over it, as you have Harvey. And what did you say to me? You never get over losing a pet or, or someone you really love. What happens is you eventually have to get to the point where you need to be able to function. So you put it all away in a box and then you put that box away. And then every now and then the lid pops off the box, sometimes like a jack in the box out of nowhere, sometimes because it's time to open the box and have a look. And then you just, you're back there. With all the hurt, with all the pain. And all the memories. Yep. But it's so hard because they're all great memories. But now you just have this missing thing, this devastating missing thing. I think with a pet, you, you have that thing where you keep going. They should be here. They should be there. This is what they like to do. I need to get that done for them or pick up this or... It's like a child, really, I suppose, except they never grow up. So you're you're their carer. You're you're their person. So. So you. Your pet dies, you put it in a box and you bury it. And then the grief is so strong that you eventually have to put that in a box and bury it. Yeah. And then that the difference, I suppose, the only difference is the. Uh, Grief keeps coming back, but the pet doesn't. Yeah, that's all you're left with, really. I mean, you do have the great memories, but it's so hard. Yeah. It's so, un I know I keep saying it, but it's so unfair. He seemed to be great. He really was great. Yeah. We were sort of beginning to think it was over with his illness, and yeah. we were looking forward to many more years. He was only, um, we can only estimate, we were told he was about four when we spoke to his previous owner and he lived with us for six years, maybe even more, six and a half. So let's say he was four and a half, six and a half, 11. So he could have been 10 to 12, which is basically not young. I mean, he's like a 50 year old man at that point. But of course, you know, men live to 80, 90. Some cats live to 20 something, right? Yeah. So, you know, we thought, in the middle of his life and he looked great oh, he was so healthy he did have a little jack nicholson paunch on him but it suited him <laughs> <laughs> a little swaggery thing but uh he was still super fast and boy the way he'd take those stairs he'd be at the bottom of the stairs and i'd go come on charlie come on and he'd wait and he'd look at me come on charlie and the next thing like a bullet come flying up those stairs but i think what you're talking about there i i get that too it's you look and you know that he should be sitting on that chair and then it's the missingness it's all the spaces where you like your brain tricks you and it kind of flashes a picture of him there and he should be there and we're also getting that thing i'm sure some of the people listening know it 
in the corner of your eye, like you see him walking the room and you look and he's not there. Um, well, it's the same when you lose a person you yeah. love. It is the same. I, I guess, I guess what happens is we, we understand and we, we get it when somebody loses a family member that's a person. But we don't often, not everybody understands what it's like if you lose a family member that's a fur baby, as they call it sometimes. It's it's that, you know, it's almost like not. Well, hold on, hold on. This is a good thing to get into because you lost your father at the age of nine. Okay. Uh, right. So you have the first hand experience of losing a human who was as close to you as can be. Uh -huh. And twice now you've had the experience of losing a really, really close, uh, loved pet. Okay. And what's the difference? Is there a difference in terms of the grief? No. Okay. So would you, you'd say there, it's as strong for the, yes. the cat as it is for your dad? Yes. And you don't see any difference? No. Okay. It's what you love. Yeah. It's just, love is love. That's it. And it doesn't matter whether it's, it could be your best friend, it could be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever it happens to be, a cat, a dog, uh, a hamster, it doesn't matter if you have that connection. Yeah. It's that you're missing and you want to give that love. All of a sudden you have this pent up, like, he was probably one of the most kissed cats on the planet. Yeah. You know, you, you have that pent up feeling of what, what do I... What did I do before I met Charlie the cat? Yeah. What did I do before I met Harvey the dog? And who am I without my dad? It's it's that thing. It's that. What do I do now? So since you're a person who's experienced that, and nobody can take that away, and how you feel, for those people out there who are the way I used to be, and might think or say to somebody. In your position hey listen it's just a cat it's just a dog it's just a parakeet come on man get over it we know they're not trying to be mean no and they are really just doing what probably they've seen and experienced and maybe have had done to them sure. and they don't have the words and they don't know how to deal with grief grief is one of these weird things it's like death when they're so connected that we kind of ignore it and we kind of make people go and deal with it on their own and it's kind of unspoken, right? So if there's anybody like that listening and they're still not getting it, what would you say to them in terms of what they might do in the future if somebody is grieving? And it doesn't really matter if it's a cat or if it's a father or a best friend. What do you think is the best way for them to behave around the person grieving or say to them just sit with them you don't have to say anything just sit with them just just let them know it's okay it's okay wherever you are in this moment of sadness it's okay and and you know what that'll be huge because sometimes when you're grieving you feel like i've been doing it too long or i shouldn't fall apart or people won't understand but it's actually perfectly okay and if your friend or your family member or whoever it is, just just is there. That's all. They don't they don't even have to say anything. Just be with them. Yeah, but isn't it funny? Isn't that what we get from our pets? Yeah. That's the that's the difference. I think. I guess children, young children, and pets have this magic, which is, you will be with me in this moment, and you're in this moment. You're not worried about. What could happen next week or tomorrow you're not worried about what happened last year you're just in this moment and this moment because i'm with you it's perfect that's that's what children and pets give to us and it the, just, the um, joy of the joy of a pet is yeah. they never grow up yeah i think you're right now touching on some of there are some differences right i've had some family relatives die as you know, I've had my, strangely enough, my stepdad and my dad died within 24 hours of each other, about six, five, five six years five, ago. 
Happy before that, my aunt. Before that, my other aunt. I think there is a bit of a difference between, say, I, I put adults over here and I put pets and babies over here because I think pets and babies. Toddlers. Toddlers. They're innocent. So that's one thing. And they give you this kind of love that's, um, it's well, it's unconditional. And, and I think that's okay from a cat and, and a child. Adults, I'm not so sure about. But also this sort of unfiltered, pure love and trust. And joy. And joy. And when you're with them, if you're really getting that, you're in the moment. People do all this mindfulness training and meditation, and I'm all for it. But another way, if that doesn't work for you or you want some other way as well, a pet that you love and you stroke and, and be with. I mean, when Charlie was right beside you purring and you just have your hand on him and there is some kind of healing thing going on there, they <laughs> say. Um, it's supposed to help our immune system. Yes, yeah, so if you want to, oh, that reminds me being in the now. So I have a favorite writer called Kurt Vonnegut Jr. who died in 2007. I was pretty heartbroken about that. Anyway, we stumbled across a uh, fantastic documentary called, uh, what was it? Unstuck in Time about Kurt Vonnegut's life, which was made over, uh, geez, what was it? 30, 40 years? 40. 40 years this guy was following him around. The guy who actually was the director of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he kept videotaping and talking to him and finding old videos Kurt, you know, came up with and pictures. And he put it all together in this absolutely amazing and riveting uh, documentary that I highly recommend to anybody, but do have tissues beside you because you will cry and you will laugh. And you'll be amazed at the life this beautiful man had. But he said, he is a lot of great little sayings. And he gives this talk to, or used to give these talks to the graduating classes of different colleges and universities. And one of the things he'd say to them was, um, you know, sometimes, you know, life is, is full of, full of pain and suffering, but some little moments you've got to stop and you've got to be in the moment and notice the beauty and the love. And when that happens, say to yourself, if this isn't nice, what is? And uh, on the last day, On the last great bee catching day with Charlie, it was sunny out the back. It was about nine o'clock and I was getting ready to go up and do some writing. And uh, so I went outside and petting Charlie and he was rolling around and he was pawing me and then he was licking my hand and there was a lot of love. And, and I remember that and I was in the moment and it was just this pure joy between us. And I said that. I said it out loud to Charlie, if this isn't nice, what is? And another <coughs> wise saying from Kurt Vonnegut was, life is a terrible way to treat an animal. <laughs> and I think he meant humans as well. Life is pretty tough and cruel sometimes, but I think that's the thing. It is all those terrible things. And maybe even these days, who knows, it's worse. But there is the good things and there are the the love and the beauty and the peacefulness if you can find it and when you get these things and sometimes you have to create them somebody once said um enjoy you know enjoy yourself and they went on to say um it's not so much that you go to somebody or some place or a book or a movie or your pet to get enjoyment no you bring the joy, you bring it. So bring joy to everything you can. And, um, you know, I'm just learning. I'm in my fifties and I feel like I'm only waking up. And, um, I guess this is the thing I talked about my friend earlier, these things that happen that are so devastating and hard. I think we have a choice now we can walk through them like a sleepwalker and not really deal 
where we can just disconnect and keep disconnecting to the point where we have such a wall built up that on the one hand, yeah, great. We don't feel the pain. We don't feel the suffering. We don't have grief. But you know, we don't have the other things either. We don't feel the joy and the love and the excitement of living. And that's the payoff. If you're going to love, you're going to have pain. But the question is, is it worth it? And I put it to you, Orla, right now in the depth of your grief, if you could go back and be gardening and he didn't pop his little head up and none of this happened and you could get out of this grief you're having now, would you? No. No. You'd do it again, wouldn't you? Oh, God, every second of it. So that's the price, isn't it? We have to pay the price and why that is and what's the point and is it fair? Because humans are sadly like I know there's a song about it where we were taught to grow up and be logical and stuff like that yeah. and we put up these sometimes prickly outer shells and if you really scratch at the surface of most people there is a tremendous heart in there that's probably been hurt and the one gift you can give yourself if you have the chance if you can't have children but if you have the chance to have a cat or a dog or something that you can give all that love to that can you can drop that shell that protects you throughout your day. You have to do it. It's the greatest gift you can give yourself and you're also giving to them. And there's many animals out there that are looking for a home. Yes. And it'll be just beautiful if people would just go, if, I'm li if you're living on your own, you should do it. If you're unhappy in your life for some reason, you should do it because it will pull you out of that and make you see there's so much more than just the things that we're suffering through every day. There's just so much more. We're allowed to have more. And I wouldn't change it. <laughs> he, he gave me everything. I wouldn't change a minute. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, he was perfect. And I have to say, and I hope I'm not the only one who notices, you know, he made me a better man. Yeah, me too. He Why made... would I? Not a man. <laughs> <laughs> a woo man. <laughs> but he made me... Appreciate. I mean, Orla was the first person who started to get me to develop a, a more of a, a thing with animals, you know, appreciating them. She had Harvey when I met her and I saw her love for Harvey and his love for her. And I slowly, I got to like Harvey an awful lot, but I didn't know him for very long. And Orla has a thing. She walks down the street and if there's a dog across the road, don't run over to her. There's something coming off her that all animals seem to love. Every dog she meets, she even has cats come up to her. But maybe part of her trick is she usually has treats on her. <laughs> <laughs> she whips out a treat for the dog or the cat. Um, but I never would have guessed, kind of like nature. My mother, I didn't know at the time because she's a massive lover and appreciator of nature was always talking about plants and flowers and she gets so excited to be in nature. And again, as a teenager and in my twenties, thirties, too busy with business and being a businessman and all that shit, I never really got it. I understood she liked those things and yes, flowers are pretty. Okay, let's move on. But Orla and my mother instilling that in me and that would come back later. And Orla with her garden, and um, we have these beautiful parks where we live. So I, I'm kind of mellowing out, and I'm beginning to realize that um, these little simple things, and again, that's what a cat or a dog or a baby teach us. They're so full of joy for the little things, and they appreciate them, and they're in the now, and they don't have all this garbage going on in their head, and agendas and uh, you know getting things and they can just be and they can just i mean a cat just is a cat it just that's the thing too you know a cat is a cat and a bee is a bee and there's no duplicity and there's no wondering like you do with people this person presents themselves with this mask well you see i think with an animal or a child a young child you're always, you're good enough. 
when we meet growing ups, maybe we're worried that we're not good enough in some way, whatever way that happens to be. We all have different things, but with an animal, and with a child, and they like you, you're perfect. I think you've nailed it there. That's, you know what that's about? I think it's uh, the difference between a human and this thing you're talking about and a baby or a cat or dog is you don't feel good enough around a lot of humans or adults because you know they're judging you. They're judging you. Are you good enough? Why don't you do this? Why don't you act more like your sister? All that kind of stuff. Am I good enough? But the cat or the baby or the dog, they're not doing that. Well, actually, they tell you you're perfect. Oh, they yeah. They reflect back to you that you are perfect the way you are. And then they make you a better person. Yeah. That's the funny part. They make you better. Yeah, we, we've been through... We've been through 10 years of a nightmare situation and it's easy to slowly, your heart grows a callus and it becomes hard. And that certainly happened to me. And I was not only hard hearted, I was uh, angry. And um, Charlie softened my heart, took away that shell around it. And it wasn't only for him. I was more aware of others and more aware of kindness. Just, just try to be kind, not for any other reason than just to do it. If we could all spread a little more kindness and awareness of others and their needs and give without expecting anything back, people, it's a trite cliche, but it's so true, you know, um, Kindness for kindness sake, you know, just do it. Don't you get more from just doing it without expecting anything. That is the, the reward to just be kind. Lead by example. Don't tell people that they have to do this or that. Be understanding. Be there for them. And that's the best we can do. Um, and Charlie, in a weird way, uh, taught me that. And Orla's taught me that. And I'm just trying to be better all the time. And I'm not uh, perfect and I'm far from it. And I have loads of my own little problems. But um, as long as we're getting a little better every day, and a little kinder every day. But Charlie thought you were good enough. Yeah, That's Charlie funny. thought I was great. <laughs> Charlie just thought I was the bee. And he loved my Prada shoes. I mean, <laughs> he'd get down there and lie on top of them. He loved the smell of the leather and he'd scratch them and... You know, they were really expensive, and I didn't care that he scratched them. No, they were. No, who cares? Yeah, um, he could wreck anything. We didn't care. And remember, we were talking about, so we spent a lot of time getting on the bus from our home and going into the city to go into the uh, courts with various uh, battles that I had, and Orla was uh, accompanying me and being supportive. And sometimes, you know, it, it took its toll, 10 years of this. And, you know, sometimes I'd be coming home, not in the best mood, and I might be irritable, and we might be, we never have really fought screaming at each other or those kind of arguments, but, you know, being a little narky and stuff, being all wrapped up in the horribleness of it and feeling terrible. And as we approached the house, and then we started to think, you know, as soon as we opened the door, Charlie's going to come running down the stairs and he's going to rub up against your legs and he's going to want love. And it would all dissolve. It would all dissolve. So again, what Orla was saying, if, if you're, especially if you're alone uh, or alone as an elderly person and you've never had an animal and you think, I couldn't even, how could I cope with that? A little cat, a little dog, my brother, I think he's going through what, what I went through with Charlie. He got himself a little dog and he was not a dog person. He never had a dog. And uh, I, I think he was kind of like me. He liked animals, but you know, that's about as far as it went. But for whatever reason, what is it? Over a year now or so, he got a dog, puppy. And um, through, <laughs> he lives in America too. So he sees my mother a lot. And through what she tells us about him and the way he behaves with the dog 
it drives her a little nuts. <laughs> oh, uh, Scout needs to go out now. I better get up and do this. Oh, I better walk Scout. Oh, I better give Scout some no, I water. Think, you know, I think the truth of it is it's, she, she thinks it's quite a beautiful thing yeah. to see. And I think it is. And, and you know what's interesting, too? I think a couple who get a dog, maybe the children are grown up or never, maybe they never had children. And you get into this habit of maybe being a bit, not meaning to, but it can happen where people get a bit sharp with each other or impatient with each other. And all of a sudden you're looking at the person you love acting so gentle and so sweet with this yeah. little fur baby. And you realize, oh, there he is. Yeah. There's yeah, that it. person. All that life that's happened that steals from you and changes you. And then all of a sudden it's like, there it is. There's that, there he is. There's that person. And you know, anybody who has the space should really think about it because it won't it won't bring any sadness until like a day we've had. Yeah. But apart from that, you'll probably get so much out of it. Yeah, the price you will pay in the end will be nothing compared to what you got. Oh yeah. Um, life keeps taking bites out of you, and uh, it's it's very easy to get hardened and cynical. And that's what these little animals do. They, they remind us and they bring us back. And as Orla said, you watch somebody with their animal and wow, you see them, you know, there they are. They're still, there's that kindness. There's that love and tenderness. So we debated back and forth whether we would do this. It's very raw. It's completely unscripted. All, all I said to Orla was look, it might be therapeutic for both of us and if it can help even just one person that if they uh, find something useful in this podcast that you know it'd be worth doing and um, we had no plan we just said let's just talk to each other and talk about Charlie and whatever thoughts we have around grief and um, we sat down and did it and this is one take so far if there's any gaps I might edit them out I do plan on taking some of the better pictures of Charlie and putting them in. So maybe there'll be a slideshow with this and you can see Charlie and some of the, the garden that Charlie so loves and where he, where he's resting now. So, well, I'm going to call it quits on this now. And, um, this also created a new category of, um, podcast I'll be making called Candid Conversations, where I hope to be talking to people, probably mostly one-on-one, -on -one, maybe one-on-two -on -two sometimes, just having conversation, not interviewing them. There's enough of that. Just people talking openly, unguardedly, you know, about important topics that maybe don't really get talked about enough. Perhaps you'd like to be on one of those shows. You'd like to have a conversation with me. doesn't matter where you are. As you know, with technology, you could be in Timbuktu and uh, we just go on uh, a face call thing. We can do it with our faces showing or not. Um, if you're interested in that, you have something you want to discuss, just uh, let me know. Email me. So with that, I just want to say uh, thanks for listening. Hope this has been of some use. I would very, very much appreciate it to help my channel grow because that's where I'm putting my time now and hope to make a career out of it as I'm kind of housebound with my current health issues. If you please like or dislike, it helps either way. Most importantly, share to get the, um, to get the uh, numbers up and uh, subscribe. Also, if you make a comment, uh, any comment at all, is fine because that helps the analytics and the uh, algorithms and the potential success of the podcast. Uh, I'd be so grateful to you for that. So in closing and in memoriam of Charlie, the tuxedo cat, love you, Charlie. And <sighs> he lives in our heart now. Could you win it? To a trance. I'll never forget you, Charlie. The childlike vision became so fun. Peace out. And we heard the bell was in the church. We loved so much and felt the presence of the youth of eternal summers in the
the car. All right. And as it touched your cheeks so lightly, born again, you were and blushed. And we touched each other lightly. <laughs> 